Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Jew and Gentile podcast. I am your host, Chris Katolka, and with me is none other than the sage himself, the Jewish sage, the one and only Mr. Steve Herzig. How are you, sir? I am doing good. Recovering from the election yesterday. That's right. Uh, this is not a political podcast. We, we are not political at all, but, but let's I, just say I'm disappointed. It worked this, and you're from Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. I don't know what well, happened I, in Pennsylvania. I'm not telling you I'm from Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. Oh, that's I am true. a Buckeye. You are a Buckeye. I and am Ohio a Buckeye. for our little. Po- Hold on a second. Here we go. Welcome in, welcome in. No, we are not a political podcast. If you want that, you can go to your 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 political whatever side you want to turn on the TV, the radio, the podcast, whatever. Steve and I have our our viewpoints. I have an opinion. You have an opinion. I have an I'm opinion. I'm Jewish. I probably sometimes have conflicting opinions. <laughs> you know, actually, we should talk about on the podcast at some point why most Jewish people tend to vote in a more liberal direction. You actually have a whole message you've put together on that. I did. Yes, there's reasons. And the reasons actually make sense. Uh, I understand there's tradition, to quote Tevia. Uh, and so, yes, Jewish people traditionally are liberal. Okay, so we're going to have to put that down but as that's, a... Yeah, and that's not a political message. It explains the thinking of Jewish people as a... It, it, there's blocks. There's all Evangelicals are a voting block, and there's a reason and history as to why they vote that way. And uh, Jewish people vote a particular way. Now, you take certain blocks of groups, of communities that are unofficially aligned, they think a certain way. There's groupthink. Mm -hmm. Uh, We divide uh, baby boomers from your generation and from your generation, and they do studies, and they break voting habits, and they can come to conclusions where they can predict analytically the chances of a particular uh, group and how they're going to vote. Yeah, so. it's the I, for me, uh, election night is always fun. I don't know why. I just love it. it. You know, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to for my little personal perspectives on politics. Uh, I'm, I, and I live in New Jersey, so I mean, it never. Your worked. expectations are pretty low. <laughs> I, I don't even know why and I vote. And now mine are going to be <laughs> low, too. But, uh, you know, I always get a kick out of the election night, though, because it's when all of those polling data and all the things you've been reading about for weeks and months leading up, it all finally meets its culmination and bupkis. Well, you know, here's for, what I say about for poll, me, poll, for poll me. numbers. We used it as a Yiddish word. Fe. Fe. <laughs> That's right. Who needs Poll it? numbers. Fe. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so, and actually, uh, the whole thing is fartic. It's over, right? <laughs> That's not a bad. Or no, it's not a bad word, but we're not trying to be indecent here. You're, we were talking about a Yiddish word we haven't even used yet. I know that's, that's the bonus word today is fartic, which it which actually means it's done. Let it be. It's over. So let's have this conversation fartic. Yeah, this conversation's fartic. And so anyway, Steve and I have been spending the morning just talking about. Uh, uh, our fun political uh, perspectives. Hey, really quick, uh, FOI, uh, or the Jew and Gentile podcast is sponsored by FOI Equip. Go to FOI Equip right now. Sign up for our upcoming classes. Paul Pierce is going to be teaching on Zionism for the next two weeks starting tomorrow, November 10th, 7.30 p.m. You can go to foiequip.org to register to learn about Zionism. Hey, listen, if you're listening to this podcast, Steve, I have to be honest. I, I mean, I, I can't vouch for every listener. But if you're going to sit down and listen to you and me, they don't have a life. Yeah. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> That's, they all just turned off the podcast right there. <laughs> I'm kidding. Wait, I, I have to tell you, you mentioned Paul Pierce. We were in a Spokane, Washington over this past weekend at a prophecy up close. And Paul said to me during lunch, we have a break. We have two messages in the morning. You were in Richmond and had it and two messages or one message in the afternoon and then questions and answers. And we were eating lunch and behind me. All of a sudden, there's this big, we have this big screen, and there's you and me, and I'm hearing us talk. Paul Pierce told the man, the tech guy, to put on the Jew and the Gentile (laughs) podcast during lunch. That was hilarious. (laughs) Well, you know, if you're listening, then you probably have a heart for Israel and the Jewish people, or you want to learn the Bible from a Jewish perspective if you're going to invest 
you know, an hour hanging out with Steve and I uh, as we talk about uh, the Bible from a Jewish perspective when we look at events happening in Jewish culture in Israel. And so uh, if that's something that drives you, that you're listening and you're a part of kind of the mission of what we're doing here, then I think that you should join Paul Pierce's Zionism class because quite honestly, it probably means you're a Zionist and you don't even know it. And that term actually has kind of become like a derogatory term for some people, the idea of being a Zionist. You know, uh, what does that even mean? What does it mean to be a Zionist? I'm proudly a Christian Zionist, um, and I know that you are as well, Steve. And so if you're quite, you know, if you're wondering, you know, what does Zionism mean? What does it mean to be a Zionist? You know, do I fall into that category? You need to go to Paul Pierce's class on Zionism. He's going to give you a great biblical and political basis for Zionism. Yeah, I talked to Paul about doing it. He really enjoys uh, working on it. And yes, uh, you read the Bible and you read about Israel. Yeah. And that's a his- history, but it's a history that also looks forward. And it's a, a, also a history that looks to the present. You can learn. In fact, as we're going through the book of Jonah, uh, we'll be in chapter three. It's amazing how that book, written back then, applies to now and applies also to 2,000 years ago. So it was forward-looking. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's forward-looking. Well, at the time, he's a missionary to people he doesn't really want to go to. Uh, It has relevancy to him and to the Ninevites. It had relevancy uh, 2,000 years ago for Jesus, who used his name and referenced him. Mm -hmm. It has relevancy to us, and it has relevancy to the future. That's right. Um, And so you you should definitely uh, uh, sign up for this free class, FOI Equip class. Keyword. Free. Go to foiequip.org. And then uh, just a quick plug, uh, in uh, in December— uh, we're going to have a w- one night, a guest lecture with David Brog, who's the former executive director of KUFI, Christians United for Israel, a very large Christian Zionist organization. And he's going to talk about the, he's not even a believer. He's not a, he's not a, he's not a Christian. He's Jewish, but he led a very large Christian Zionist organization. That is hilarious. Isn't that, I want to talk to him about that. A, a Jewish guy leading Christians yeah. who are for Israel. You can't make this stuff up. Well, he just loves evangelical Christians, and he understands the value of Christian Zionism. And so anyway, there's that. Hey, Steve, really quick, can I do, can I say two things about two Go listeners? Right I know that there are two listeners out there right now. The first I'd like to highlight are Bob and Laura Bransberg from North Carolina, who came to the PUC, the Prophecy Up Close, I spoke at in Richmond, Virginia, and they were a little distraught about the fact that Patty is considered the number (laughs) one fan of the Jew and Gentile podcast. They let us know that they listen all the time. They love the Yiddish word of the day. And she was even giving me some advice, which I appreciate, about some future content that we could do on the podcast. So we have a competition for for, uh, number one fan. So... You know, we might have to have some type of duel or so, I don't know. What do we do for our number one fan? But, well, have uh, them write in and have um, uh, Patty write in and say why they love the Jew and the Gentile <laughs> podcast. Right. And then we'll give it to uh, some neutral person in FOI to judge who is the number who one fan. Who is the number one fan? And if That's there's right. any of the six people who are listening out there. Yeah, the, oh, these guys are crazy. <laughs> We're losing them as we speak, you know. And <laughs> And if they want to send in why they think they are a number one fan, we'll take them all. Okay, so that was. I want to give a shout out to our friends Bob and Laura, uh, and they drove three hours, Steve, from North Carolina. They've done. They, I've known them, talked with them. They are so familiar with FOI. We love them. We, we're obviously just joking now, and uh, but I'm serious about the competition. Yeah. Let let us know. We'll get pick somebody who's neutral. And we'll come up with the number oh, one. Oh, we'll fan. give out. We'll give we'll out an give award. Out an award. Yeah, that's we'll give right. out a an trophy. Award. What should a the trophy, trophy be? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll have a picture of your face or something like that. You know, <laughs> no, that's that's to the loser. <laughs> that's <laughs> not the winner. Well, uh, so uh, Bob and Laura, great people. Thankful that they listen to the Jew and Gentile podcast and are are fans of the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. My other one is this, Steve, my for, uh, pastor in Dallas, Texas, when we lived there. 
uh, Neil Tomba, he listens to the podcast. Hi, Pastor Neil. Um, he likes what, to, when he cuts the grass or something. No, when he runs or <laughs> I think or rides his bike, he told me. So anyway, uh, he was we, he was commenting a couple of weeks ago to me about one of our Yiddish words. And we had spoke during one of the uh, the messages uh, um, d- during our podcast about the Happy Meals for adults from McDonald's. And so the Yiddish word of the day that day was shlamil. And he said to me. You know, I thought you were going to connect the McDonald's Happy Meal for adults to Schla Meal and say those those uh, uh, Happy Meals for adults are like a Schla Meal, you know. <laughs> but we didn't go there. Boy, they are that, thinking like us now. That that's dangerous. That is really dangerous. So anyway, uh, I'm actually hoping to have uh, Pastor Tamba on to talk about uh, support for Israel and the Jewish people, and he's a pastor who loves. Uh, Israel and the Jewish people, and um, and I've been inspired by him in, in his desire to want to know more. And so he has some opinions I'd like for him to share with That'd us. That'd be great. So That'd we're going to have him on. But you've got another insight here on Did Jew Know? That's right. A real book written by Emily Stone. And in fact, Chris, we got an email from someone who went out and bought the book. We don't get... We don't get anything for it, but somebody contacted you to tell you they got. Did you know? Oh yeah, and they're somebody really bought it. Yeah, somebody they bought, bought it. the book. So <laughs> I just think it's it tells you so many little bits and pieces of Jewish history and culture and all that kind of thing. And so this one says it's a sin in Frisco when they fry their latkes up in Crisco, the Jewish delicatessen, and why it is as American as apple pie. An establishment that features salami as decoration and serves such cliché Jewish delicacies as matzo ball soup and Mm. sky-high towers of various pickled meats on rye is actually a Jewish-American derivative of a type of specialty store that originated in Germany. 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 Indeed, lack of refrigeration necessitated the various forms of pickling and curing meat that were the progenitors of such crowd favorites as... Oh, pastrami, corned beef, mm. both somewhat easier to come by in the land of opportunity where meat was more readily available than if it do had. We have a, do we have a budget line for lunches during the Jew and Gentile podcast? Uh, not I'm getting enough hungry. To buy. Oh, yeah, I'm getting yeah. hungry. When German and Eastern European Jews began arriving in New York during the first wave of migration in the late 19th century, they first encountered German deli selling traditional pickled and smoked beef pork and uh, pondered how best to Jewify this specialty <laughs> idea and schlep with it. <laughs> Since real estate was expensive and hard to come by, the Lower East Side was then the most densely populated area on earth. The people of the book put their kepis together. That's, That's their head, great, the Jewish head. And prayed unto the Lord until at last it hit them like a ton of mustard. Push carts. How better to serve the unassimilated population packed into tenements and basically trapped by a lack of decent public or private transportation. By 1910, Jews had become New York City's largest immigrant group, and the Jewish version of the German delicatessen began popping up all over town in the form of small specialty shops and push carts. By the time the deli business Wended its sodium infused, way indoors <laughs> traditional Eastern European Jewish food. Jeez, al- this is good writing. Had already become synonymous with delicatessen, a uh, term the Jews had pretty much single handedly ushered into popular parlance by the 1930s. As Jews were moving from the Lower East Side to South Bronx and Brooklyn, the city had as many as 1,500 kosher delicatessens. Today, there are only about two dozen. Sad face. Yep, that is sad face. <laughs> Through New, though New York, New York contained far more delis than any other North American city. Similar Jewish eateries could be found in other cities with sizable Jewish populations such as Morris and Schiff's in Boston, mm-hmm. Cohen's in Los Angeles, Bott's in Chicago, and Schwartz's in Montreal. And then it goes on to list. It doesn't even mention Katz's? No, it doesn't mention Katz's. I don't know why. That's, uh, e- that's in Manhattan. And by the way, Katz's got hit with uh, inflation. 
thirty-two dollars for a set. I don't know how you. How do you, I mean? You'd have to be a real tourist to want to go get a thirty-two dollar uh, well, pastrami. I'll tell on you. Rye. I'll tell you. You just divide it by three. Go. They're so big. They're huge. You just go with two other people, and then it's ten bucks. Yep. Yeah. Or less than ten. No, I've heard great things about Schwartz's. I've not heard about that one in L.A. though. Cohen's. 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 Have you been there? I have not been there. No. But. You know, I've made it a personal, um, a, a, a personal endeavor. To find the best locks and bagels in the Cherry Hill area, which is a very Jewish area of South now, Jersey. Now, are you? Do you like Nova or regular? I, oh, that's a good question. No, I do Nova. Yeah, Nova is even more expensive. Yeah, and it's it locks actually taste different depending on how thin the slice is. Yeah, it's gotta be thin. I, I always there's a place in Cherry Hill that I go to where they do I do an everything bagel. And I do lox, cream cheese with the... Uh, do you put capers on them? Capers, lettuce, tomato, uh, and they onion. cram... Onion. Oh, and onions. Oh, you got to go it with all the onion. Yep. And then no one goes near you. No, ex- that's, the, that's the way I do it. That's right. That's how I keep people keep, out of my office. Keep your distance. What's going on with that guy in there? And no, that, that's been my... I go as many places I can to find the best... And then, you know what? They all do pretty good. There are some I go, I'll never go back there, but some of them pack them out. It's delicious. Yep. It's fantastic. It, it's, uh, oh, man. Hey, I got saved because of lox bagels and cream cheese. That's, so a, what do, what that's right. Do? See? So, you, yeah. you ate a lot of lox that I day. I ate a lot of lox. <laughs> <laughs> and your grandkid likes lox. That's right. Eli. Eli he, likes he lox. He loves lox. Yep. And he's young. What is he? Four? He, he's three? five. Yep. He's, but he's been eating it since he's been three. He He's five and he likes to eat he lox. He calls for lox. He goes to his granny and says, can I have some lox? He's got good taste. He I'm does telling have you. good Man, taste. Right to he's the top. He's got good taste. All right. So speaking of uh, good taste, we've been going through Jonah. And here's a guy that the good taste was the fish ate him. Yep. Okay. And then spit him back out Fat. on land. That's Fat. Get him out. <laughs> That's right. The moment he repented, boom, he's on it, the land. It was Fat after he got to the right place to let him off. That's right. And That's so the Jewish submarine. Exactly. And then, and then he has to walk to Nineveh. He finally does what God calls him to do. And that's where we pick up. But Chris, I got to start off because to me, the first line is a line that I relate to. And then I'll turn it over to you. But it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Yes. That is amazing. Yes. God is a God of second chances. I'd submit to you it's probably three, four, five sometimes. The Bible's filled with people who needed Another shot. Yep. Right? And I, that is a great, because I, I think I had men- mentioned before, and, I, and I'll bring it up again, is that what we're about to see is that if Jonah had just done what God asked him to do, we would actually only have this one chapter, that if Jonah would have just listened and done what he was supposed to do as God commanded him, we would only have Jonah chapter 3 in the Bible. But everything else is based around Jonah's his sin of selfishness, really. And so you're right. God gives him a second chance. And that, that you know, I was just reading, Steve, uh, with Ex- in Exodus 34, uh, in the previous verse, uh, chapters as well, the, the golden calf incident. I mean, here is the moment where the Israelites, M- Moses goes up to receive the law. 40 days, he's gone. He comes down, and the Israelites have already abandoned God, broken rule number one and number two, and totally built a false idol worshiped another god Aaron is leading the way and god still leads them into the promised land he should have divorced them in that moment but he doesn't you know chris you you said that uh if he would have just listened he we would have only had chapter 3 but in his disobedience so meant for bad it's meant for bad they were dis- he was disobedient but you know remember what it says in um verse 15 of uh chapter 1 it says, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. If he was obedient, he wouldn't have met That's true. these guys who turned to the living God. Yes. So what was meant for evil, and it was disobedience, God turned it around and used it for good. Not so much for Jonah, because he ended up uh, in the fish and had... Uh, who knows how he smelled after and what he looked like, but these men believed in the living God. And and that's what's about to happen is Jonah's about to make his trek through Nineveh. And so Steve opened it up by saying that God gave Jonah a second chance, and so he went to Nineveh and proclaimed the message 
uh, that God gave him. And it says in verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Verse 4, Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, here's, here's the gospel, if you will, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth, which means they repented. And when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, sat down in the dust. This was the proclamation he issued to the Ninevites, and then we'll go on from there. But Jonah's message, the idea is that Jonah's message was reaching the common person, and it reached all the way up to the, the king himself of Nineveh. It's amazing. It's such a short message. Uh, they don't seem to ask any questions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's Hey, guys, it's over for you unless uh, you got 40 days and it's going to be over. And that was enough. That was that was enough for them. Mm-hmm. And they repented and turned and believed God. Uh, you know, Chris, uh, we, were, we were talking about disappointments. If you're disappointed in an election or you're disappointed in romance or you're disappointed... People get disappointed. The key is, whatever that disappointment is, who are you trusting, mm-hmm. believing? And in in this case, the message is, hey, trouble's coming. What's their response? They believe. And it's a this is a sophisticated place. Uh, by the way, the people, the, the Ninevites weren't nice people. Yeah, we had mentioned Chris, it. Yeah. yeah, Chris, these people, they were impaling people. Yeah. They, they buried people. And up to their head and drove horses over them. They they did despicable, awful things. There is a logical reason why Jonah didn't want to go there. But God cared about them. And God cares about us too. Mm. And in comparison, a sin is sin in God's eyes. We're just as unholy as the Ninevites. Uh, God sent Jonah to them and they repented. And God sent Christ to us. That's an amazing thing. Uh, in a little bit, I want to run some parallels there between Jonah and Christ. And the idea of the Jewish people, like here's Jonah, a, a Jewish prophet, going into the Gentile world. The Goyesha area. Yeah, the Goyesha, that's right. Exactly. We're going to the Goyim. That's right. And so but l- let me just go on here, because now the king dec- makes a decree, because now he makes it a... A national issue for his people. It says, by decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but so they're supposed to fast, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone be uh, call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? <clears throat> Excuse me. God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them destruction as he had threatened. What a great chapter. Yeah. I mean, it, and it, and God doesn't spend a lot of time telling us about it. Jo- Jonah went, he preached a very short message, but he had to do it a long, three days walking mm-hmm. around that city. And Chris, think about it. Don't you wonder what was going through his mind as he keeps repeating the same message? Uh, you know, it's it wasn't the way he looked that appealed to them. It wasn't his uh, his how well he spoken he was. It's a pretty short message. the The saving belongs to God. Do you do you think his do you think Jonah's heart was in the right place? Or do you think, because here's what's funny to me, obedience. He obeyed and did as God said. But the question is, so he did the job that God gave him, but did he do it with a heart uh, that was uh, bent toward God's will? Or was it still a heart of, uh, you know, anger and, and, and stubbornness towards God? Well, it depends on how he came out. And I'm not talking the actual physical way out of the fish. Was he a different? Was he a different person when he came? He knew that as a prophet, he knew that God was in this, and he knew that no matter where he was going, he'd have to do it. So the question is, and you're asking it is: is this done where his change of heart and he's all in? I would say no, because of chapter four. Yeah, he's so angry. He's he's yeah. he's angry and. 
He's learned. He has to learn more of the lesson. He did what he was supposed to do. But in my view, based on chapter four, I would say his heart wasn't all in it, but God's heart was in it. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. God's heart was in it and that God chose him as the messenger. And so he was obedient. They would give him that much. It kind of reminds me of Paul in Philippians when he's in prison and he talks about the fact that some people are preaching the gospel it with a uh, with a real sense of uh, urgency and seriousness to it, but some people are almost even joking about it. But yet Paul was thankful that the what, word of the Lord however, was going. However, out. they're right. preaching it, even for gain. Yes, even for their own gain. Yes, the the message itself is what's important. And give give him credit; he was obedient, stubborn but obedient. But God wasn't finished with them yet. And again, that's a lesson for us, Chris. God isn't finished with us yet. Have we done things that we knew we were supposed to do, but we weren't all in? Yeah. I know I, I've done it that way before. And so that's it, that's just the way it is. Do you and, think do you think Jonah was going like this? Uh um when when he was going around, do you think he was saying, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown? Or was he walking around going, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's probably the Gentile way. He probably said, yep, 40 days, guys. <laughs> I'm telling you, Nineveh is bupkis. Yeah, bupkis. <laughs> hey, all right. So here's some more uh, questions I have for you, because um, I think this is, especially as we tie it to the church today, um, Jew and Gentile. It's interesting to me that as there's this repentance taking place, this national repentance on on Nineveh's part, that God, that Jonah doesn't go around and say, "All right, now all of you males need to be circumcised, and you must keep kosher, and you must become like me." He never that never happened. Nope. God relented of his calamity toward the Ninevites, and they were still able to maintain their identity as a Ninevite. There's nothing about them giving that up. 100%. And so it's interesting to me because when you get to Acts chapter 15, you get to uh, the Jerusalem Council, and Paul is coming back from his missionary journey, and he's coming from going into the gen- into the Nineveh of, of Europe. He's going into, you can almost flip it. Nineveh was in uh, modern day, what is it, Iraq or that area. I don't know exactly, the, the Nineveh Plains. But that was, you know, 700 years before Jesus. You move to Jesus' day, Paul's day, Nineveh is now in Rome. Rome is the major empire of the world, and there's a whole world of Gentiles. The hub of the Gentile world is Rome now. It was Nineveh during Jonah's day, during Jesus' day, Paul's day. It's Caesar, it's Rome. And so Paul goes, I got to get out to these Gentiles and let them know that judgment is coming soon, and the Messiah has come. The King of Israel has come. I've got to get out of Israel. i got to go tell people this, the, the Gentiles. And so people are getting saved. They're coming to faith, and Paul comes back, and the big question among the apostles and the, church, the council in Acts 15 is, so what about these Gentiles who are coming to faith? Should they become like us? Should they be circumcised? Should they keep kosher law? Should they keep Torah? Should they keep these things? Or should we let them maintain their identity as Gentile without having to become Jewish, but we are linked by faith in the Messiah? And I think this taps into what's going on in Jonah as well. I almost see Paul as an obedient Jonah. I, I think that's a interesting, interesting thinking. Uh, at the time, this is before Christ, he's not going to the Jewish people, uh, he's going to Gentiles. Uh, Jewish people are uniquely God's chosen people and are living under the system that God has given to them. But I think it's evident that the message here is repentance and believing, no different, by the way, than the mariners who are in the first chapter. Exactly. Uh, Again, not Jewish and uh, not under that system. The bottom line is believing, believing, and really believing. So the mariners believed and the Ninevites believed. It was, you're right. It wasn't a question of now you got to see my rabbi and read this book <laughs> and do all that. You trust in him. And notice the mariners sacrificed. Yeah. They did sacrifice. And in the third chapter, they repented. They they took what was regarded 
even amongst Jews, as a way to express repentance, which was sackcloth and ashes, a, a great sign of mourning. In fact, to this day, when there's a funeral, a Jewish funeral, uh, they don't put on sackcloth and ashes, but they do cut the garment. They actually mm-hmm. so f- so for a man, you're wearing a a a jacket. They actually cut your lapel, and for a lady, they give you a scarf and they cut it. It's it goes back in history to this idea of renting garments, sackcloth and ashes. Uh, how awful it is, and um, it, it demonstrates repentance or great mourning, anguish. When you repent, you're you're in anguish over the condition you're in, pleading for mercy to the living God. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing that what's amazing about and and Jonah knew it. That's why he didn't want to go. He knew God was going to do this, and he didn't want to do. He didn't want to see it happen. Yeah. Next week we're going to take a look at uh, Jonah practically plagiarizes from the book of Exodus because he knows God so well, which I think will be a great conversation about the, that how well Jonah knew God's word and how that actually got— he was so confident in who God was, it compelled him to go the other direction because I he knew— I could see Jonah going like this, oh, man. <laughs> I'm out of here, buddy. <laughs> I just can't. But I, I, just, I do want to just say this, Steve, because when, when Paul did come back and met with that— with the Jerusalem council, there were two stipulations for Gentiles. It wasn't just like, ah, oh, you can keep doing whatever you want to do. Paul did trust in the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of a, of a Gentile. I, I, I believe that I, you know, there's probably a lot of concern, like, well, what if these Gentiles, they're turning to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Jesus, the Messiah, they're repenting and turning, but are they just going to act like Gentiles? We spent our whole life running from the Gentiles. And now, all of a sudden, the God we believe in is going to be associated with these Gentiles. He, he marked them out with two, those two practices. So go talk about them. Yeah, so the council says this to the Gentile community who is believing in Jesus as the Messiah. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, and this comes from Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 28, not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements, okay? The, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols— from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things, and I love it. Farewell. <laughs> that, gotta go. You gotta go. See you later. But really, I, I think what the, the, the council, the Jerusalem council, the apostles were just being guided by God through the work of the Holy Spirit in wisdom because they didn't want to make Gentiles become Jewish. But you know what they did want to do? They wanted to maintain fellowship. And I think what the, the, the things that they were saying to Gentile believers, hey, look, we're not going to make you become Jewish. You don't have to follow our customs and traditions. But here's the thing. You got to abstain from idol sacrifice, blood, uh, meat, you know, the meat strangled. And, uh, and, and the big one, too, which comes from Levit- all these coming from Leviticus, is sexual immorality. You're supposed to basically adopt a very law-based understanding of of human sexuality, one man, one woman, all of these things, will, which will define you from the culture that you live in when you're not practicing those things. But what that also enables is for Jew and Gentile to have fellowship with one another. But you, as you chose Acts chapter 15 and gave us the end, I, I, I go to verse 7, and how did they get there? It, it's very short, but at least to me, here's what it says. And when there had been much dispute... <laughs> that is so filled much could you imagine there are people on both sides the people who are saying yeah they got to come over we got to do it they got to do yeah, it yeah exactly I, they what are you talking about it's in the scripture i see it in the scripture and now you're saying who do these people think uh, much dispute i would love to just sit back and watch these guys go toe to toe yeah that, at the end is fine yeah but it, it wasn't like— It wasn't an easy process. Not at <laughs> all. That should encourage those people who might be listening who are on a board, a church board of some sort. Uh, you know, you're, you, you're, you've got a Bible study. You're leading a group of, of people, and you come to a topic— much dispute. Yep. <laughs> Everybody stand in their grounds. And be, remember who we're talking about. These were all Jewish people. Uh, we are stiff-necked, hard-hearted people, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, 
certainly, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, but standing our ground in much dispute. <laughs> I, I would have loved to see that, Chris. I would have loved to see that. Can I add one more thing, too, in light of Paul or, or Jonah going to the Ninevites? The Ninevites were not demanded to change, to become Jewish, but by faith God forgave them um, in their repentance. He relented. He At relented. Least the New King James says uh, that God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. That, he relented. He was relented. So they repented, and he relented. That's a song. He <laughs> repented. They repented, and he relented. You know, that's a sermon or whatever. <laughs> but I want to—so then we looked at uh, the Jerusalem Council and the fact that there was freedom for Gentiles in the work of the Holy Spirit. But you know what I, I find interesting is that I actually think that the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer does orient you, even though you don't have to follow— you're not required to follow the Torah. You're not required to follow the Old Testament, you know, culture and customs. the 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 work of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer is orienting you toward the things of God, though. No question. And and it's funny because when when Paul is in Ephesus, there is a Ephesus was the centerpiece of um of uh, a, a a Greek and Roman god. There was a huge um uh, uh temple there where people from all over the Gentile world would come and worship. I think it was Diana, maybe, was the Roman goddess. And uh, there were idol makers there. And the idol makers are all making a ton of money because people are coming in from all around the world to go to this place. They're selling their idols. Boom, we're making money. All of a sudden, these guys, these idol makers, start running out of money. Out of business. They're going out of business. Why? Because Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ who is guiding them to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they get so angry that they and frustrated that they basically turn on, on Paul. They know what's going on. Paul's ministering the gospel. And this is what it says here in verse 26 of Acts uh, chapter 19. They're, yet, they're upset. These, these craftsmen are frustrated. And they said, you know, my friends, that we have received a good income from this business making idols. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced— Or this fellow. <laughs> <laughs> fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in, uh, and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made with, ha- uh, with human hands are no gods at all. That is, ju- Steve, that's the law. That, that is that. the law. And Gentiles, even though there's no technical, you know, you have to follow the—no one's saying follow the Torah. There's nothing there. But they are naturally, by the work of the Holy Spirit, turning away from those pagan rituals, those idols, and turning to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Jesus the Messiah— and all of a sudden, they almost sound Jewish. These Gentiles, even though they're not required to be Jewish, they're sounding Jewish. And it's funny because I think our culture doesn't realize if you're Gentile, you might not follow do Passover or Yom Kippur, all these things, but it's, it's in us. We think about forgiveness. We think about shed blood. We think about uh, sacrificial uh, um, substitutionary atonement, the atonement we have. We think about the Messiah. We think about all of these Jewish things, the way a marriage should be, how we should raise a family. All of these things are not grounded in paganism. They're grounded in the Bible. Well, the Jewish people are God's chosen and connected that way, and we are uh, God's chosen individually before the foundation of the world, there's a connection. So there's going to be an automatic connection. Uh, You have Jewish people connected to God. You have Christians as individuals connected. Doesn't mean they're equal, because if if you believe in the God of Moses, you should believe in Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, Christ said that himself. So the connection to think Jewish is really the connection to think biblically. Exactly. That's That's what I'm saying. To think Biblically. And we were talking about a Jewish people and being liberal. That's the reason that one of the reasons they're liberal is that they, they and in our culture as well, has grown further and further away from the text. Mm-hmm. We, we used to try to follow it as a group. Then we tried to respect it. And now we are discarding it. Mm-hmm. And that, that's fair to say. I've We've in our in our courses that we've had in Equip, and when uh, Bruce Scott has his courses in Bridges, 
One of the things our students are finding out when they go to some synagogues, not all of them, but some of the more liberal synagogues, they go in there and they say, I, I, I don't understand that they, they don't do anything related to the Bible. They, they, they don't believe in God, which there are some synagogues. By the way, some churches that way too. They mm-hmm. have a cross in the front. You go in, there's no acknowledgement of God. And then when you see what they allow and the kind of behavior and what they tolerate, they're not connected with the Bible. It's more so, paganism than it is 100% biblical. So, so that's right. So people who are Gentiles who trust Christ, these Ninevites are now like Jewish people. They're not told what to do. They, they've they repented. They've turned. They believe in the living God. Look at, I don't know what Jonah told the mariners, but I'll tell you this. They knew to give a sacrifice. That's right. Well, maybe from their paganism and they it was just a heart difference where they had given sacrifice to who knows what, but they say, man, this is the living God. Forget that God. We now believe in this true God, and they offer a sacrifice. It's just amazing. Uh, But think back. I think if we think back when we first became believers and didn't know, you might not have known all the doctrines and all. Here's what you knew. I need to please God. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how your journey really begins. I need to please God. So you begin to ask questions, go to places to get those Questions answered, fellowship, etc. The whole point of the coming of the Holy Spirit was to uh, take the tablets, which were external, and to place, essentially, place the law in the heart, which means that, you know, it, it, to me, it just is the, the law is the revelation of who God is and how we should interact with God. And that's what Jeremiah 31 says. It talks about the fact that there would be a new covenant, not like the one I made with your fathers. And you're thinking about the one of the, the Ten Commandments. Well, now all of a sudden that gets placed in the heart, and you just see how Gentiles in in the Book of Acts all of they don't just they don't throw we're not they're they're not creating their own system under the guidance of the uh, the Jerusalem Council. They are a part of the body of Christ, the Church, but they're also thinking. It's just amazing. They're thinking like Jewish people. I can't go to that temple. That's a that's idol worship. I can't do that. That's that's the Ten Commandments. It's it always just baffles my mind. They were changing to think about the radical change that those Gentiles had. That at one point they were making a ton of money as craftsmen giving out idols, and now all of a sudden they're going broke because the culture changed because Gentiles were coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. They weren't getting circumcision, but Chris, their hearts were circumcised. 100%. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah four, verse four. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. You men of Judah, they already had a circumcision. They yep. were circumcised. But take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. In other words, you need a kosher heart. You yeah. already get, you're circumcised. Zygazun, live and be well. That's not what you need. You need a circumcised heart, which is why Jesus, when he talked to Nicodemus, yes. con- n- not condemned him, but rebuked him. Hey, you're a teacher in Israel? You don't understand what a circumcised heart is? Yeah. A kosher heart? A circumcised heart doesn't come through human hands. A, circumc- a circumcised heart comes from God up above. Moses wrote about it in Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. And so, they, you, Nick, you should have known about Nick. this. <laughs> come on. <laughs> and isn't it interesting... At the end, when Jesus dies and his body, who's who's there? One of the people there was Nicodemus. Oh, yeah. Yes. He no. finally understood what a circumcised heart to is. To be born again. Yep. You know, uh, th- this has just been a great study. I knew it would be fun. I-, I-, I always like to remind people whenever they think, you know, when they think about Jewish people being the chosen people, it's an exclusive club, uh, you know. The reality is, is that, and the thing that you see all throughout the scriptures is that God chose Abraham and his family to bring blessing to all the families of the earth. That was the original promise. It always included the nations. It always included the Gentile people. God wanted to reach them, and he did it through the mouthpiece uh, and the family line of Abraham, uh, right through to Jesus, the Messiah, who becomes the ultimate blessing of all the families. I wish we could put an addendum to what you just said and say, did you know? 
Did you know? <laughs> did you know that God intended this to be for everybody? For everybody. That's right. Salvation is of the Jews. Amen, brother. All right. Well, we've got some interesting news for everyone here. Steve, why don't you take it away? Okay. USA Today article, the Wizards, and we're not talking about uh, any kind of magic or stuff. We're talking about NBA, the Washington Wizards, Denai Avadia. NBA's lone Jewish player addresses Kyrie Irving controversy. Chris, this has been going on for a couple weeks now. Uh, the New York Nets aren't doing well on the uh, on the basketball court. The Brooklyn. And- that, what did I say? New York. Oh, sorry. They changed. That, they, they're in Brooklyn, yeah. which is New York, but I, that's opposite of the Knicks. Uh, this is the uh, Brooklyn, and they're in Brooklyn of all places. Brooklyn, where the <laughs> most true. Hasidic Jew, Jewish people are. I can just see them going, ah, I'm not following them anymore. The good news is that the Hasidim there don't even know what the NBA is. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. But what, it, it's interesting that Kyrie Irving, one of their stars, uh, got involved with a group uh, that uh, actually a film called Hebrews to Negroes, Wake Up Black America. And he aligned himself with that movie. And they gave him an op- a documentary. They gave him an opportunity to get out of it two different times, which he refused. And so as a result, they suspended him. But uh, and that film, I think uh, even Kanye West was highlighting a lot of what the, the oh. what was promoted in that film. Very anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish. Denying the Holocaust. Yep. It's, no, it's just no good. Anti-Israel, all that stuff. Well, as it turns out, I, I didn't know this until I read this USA article. There is one Jewish Israeli NBA basketball player. <laughs> they love basketball oh, they in Israel. they love basketball. If you ever go to Israel, there are like five or six different uh, leagues. And yet they're on TV on like... 10 different channels. Yep. I've, when I've been there, I, you flip the channel. There's another bat. How many leagues can you follow? And they're I, all the same name. They're all the Maccabees. <laughs> Maccabee Haifa, Maccabee Tel Aviv, Maccabee Jerusalem. The Maccabees are playing the Maccabees. They <laughs> love basketball. And uh, and Denis, Denai is very, very good. He was drafted in 2020, the number nine pick in the NBA. So, uh, but anyway, he had a comment. Uh, a tall Israeli. Yeah, a, Th- that alone, the guy, take a picture. Uh, <laughs> take a picture. <laughs> take a picture. Him but, and Benny Gantz. Yeah, ah, Benny Gantz, six feet eight. That's yeah, right, uh, huge. But, but I, it's understated when they asked him. This is so understated. I think he made a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You think the guy <laughs> practically throws your people under the bus, and he goes, "Ah, you made a mistake." Uh, you got to uh, Anyway, the the story goes on, and Nike uh, has since suspended its relationship with Kyrie. I just find it interesting uh, that uh, there is a player. They asked him. Uh, he talks about it, and uh, finally, Kyrie apologized. Yep. So I don't know what's going to happen. He's uh, Kyrie Irving is suspended for. A minimum of five games. He's got to do several different things. Uh, the Wizards uh, deny is uh, not too happy. I'm glad that he uh, that he spoke out against it, which he did. Well, you and I were talking about the Wizards because it's owned by. It used to be owned by Abe Poland, who is Jewish himself. I don't know who owns it now. That was he. Abe Poland was the one when he owned the Washington Bullets. Hmm. He because of the name Bullet. Uh, like from a gun, they didn't like that, so he changed it to the Wizards. Um, I don't know who owns it right now, but it, what they're ve- they have at the at the end of the article, didn't they say they had a? Uh, I'm sure somebody will be offended uh, soon that it's yeah, called the Wizards. The Wizards annually host a Jewish Heritage Night yeah. and have Twitter and Instagram accounts in Hebrew for Israeli fans. No, I, that's what I wanted to get at. That's yep. good. Yeah, so that's that's great. So that's uh, item number one. All you right. want to you tell us number two? All right, this one is like a book, Steve. This comes from the <laughs> Jerusalem Post, and uh, you sent this to me the other day, and. I thought, we have to talk about this. Orthodox women from the Jerusalem Post, Orthodox women and the evolving relationship with modesty. Uh, To better understand what's happening in the hearts and souls of Orthodox women who undergo a shift in their appearance, we spoke to five local women, all Anglo immigrants, about their journeys. So really quick before we get into this, Steve. Orthodox Jewish women are required to wear very modest clothing. You know, we're not talking about, um, you know, like— like uh, his, um, what is that called? Like the Muslim faith, where they have to wear hijabs and they have to cover their whole bodies. We're not talking about that. 
We're talking about in the Orthodox community, they actually try to make themselves very fat, the women very fashionable, uh, but modest. That's what That's they right. say. They, they, as little flesh, honestly, as possible. So they have they have either a wig or a uh, babushka or some sort of wrap around their hair. They have to cover their hair. Yes, they do. They wear If you're married. That's right. And if you uh, dress, they all wear dresses or skirts below the knee, that, and they'll wear high socks so that mm-hmm. there's no flesh there. They have to minimum cover their up to their elbows, uh, n- and most of the time long sleeves. They don't You don't see them with short sleeves. And the picture on the front, Chris, why don't you describe the gal? There's a picture there, mm-hmm. uh, and this is the major controversy because if you're in a Hasidic community and you're a married woman— uh, one of these pictures of the same woman would not be allowed technically in public. One looks like a normal woman. She's just standing there. The other one is the same woman with a head covering on. So which she's is got her, very typical. Which is very typical, especially in Israel. Uh, you know, I think the more orthodox community in the States typically wear a wig over their hair. In Israel, they wear a lot of head coverings as well. Yes, they do. But what's funny, Chris, and I, I just... It's hard for me. This would not be an Amazon number one. We, it, your book is definitely going to outsell this book, Chris. Your book is coming out in January, and you should talk about it. But listen, to what it says: it's now classic. This is a classic book by Oz Vahader, uh, and it's called "An Adornment for Life" by Rabbi Pesach Eliyahu. It's 700 pages long. Mm, filled, easy read. Easy filled read. Filled with diagrams and explanations. So <laughs> this male, he's a rabbi, he, he's a man, is writing 700 pages <laughs> to guide the Orthodox woman in her clothing choices. Yeah, this I is exactly you, what every woman wants in you life. You don't want to tell a Jewish woman what to wear. No, oh, my I, goodness. I, I, <laughs> to be honest, you don't want to tell any woman you should, what to wear. A woman should probably write a 700 page on what men should wear, not the other way around. 100 per- <laughs> 700 pages. I, and it's a classic. A classic. <laughs> it's the, I was saying to you before we went on on, on the air is that uh, this is like the Emily Post of the Jewish world. Just how the, what is the proper etiquette for being an Orthodox a uh, uh, Jewish woman, but written by a man, which just uh, don't yet. Yeah. I know that uh, back in the day, we, uh, when I was looking at houses, uh, when we were moving here, uh, I I was looking at some that were brand new houses, and the person showing us around said, "I could tell you, it, it was a woman real estate agent. I could tell you this: men are the ones that design the kitchens." Yeah. <laughs> Are they out of their mind? No one's that tall. They're going to reach up. Why is it that a man tells us how to run our kitchen? Yep. And to me, I don't want to tell you how to run the kitchen. It's hilarious that there's a ra- at, at, look. The culture is one. In all seriousness, the culture is one where the rabbi is not a rabbi. He's a rebbe. Yeah, rebbe. Yeah. And the rebbe. And the, by the way, this gets into politics in Israel. The rebbe controls some of the parties that are. We just had an election in Israel. A lot of those people vote for a particular religious body based on what the Rebbe tells them. Which to we're do. going to talk about after this news yep. piece here. That's right. Can I can I say really quick that because uh, the whole point of the article is that it goes through uh, the lives of these Orthodox women, and really it's a roller coaster ride of their adaptation to Orthodox dress and modesty. Because uh, several of them, we'll start here with Michal Sherman. Uh, she became Torah observant 20 years ago through a right wing right wing outreach group. It says, looking back, she realizes now that she was taught stringencies as if they were actual Jewish law. Steve, I got stringencies right. <laughs> we were talking go. about that. I got it right. They Im- we we actually double checked that word to make sure we were saying it right. They implored us that covering all of your hair and your uh, and your collarbone was the only way to truly dress modestly. She she related. I didn't have much exposure to modern the modern Orthodox approach at that time. And so she goes on and she talks about all these things. But it's really, Steve, a roller coaster ride because she she wears modest clothes and the head covering. And then all of a sudden she does like a half breed thing where she wears part of it halfway on her head. And then she she changes as she goes almost to the point where she's wearing a you know, we don't think anything of this, but wearing a bathing suit to the beach. Well, you know? she said, I don't want 19 layers of clothes in the water. <laughs> yes, I don't blame her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she said it. I, my sensories. At this age, at her age now, she said she has sensory overload with with the weight and the 
feeling of all that wet clothing, so she's gone to a bathing suit. Yep. It's it's very typical of law. Chris. Of course. Law at the moment there's a law, let's say the IRS changes a law. What's the first thing that people who especially who have their own account loophole? They they say, I'm hiring you whatever it costs. Tell me how to get around yeah. this. There has to be a way to get around it. And that's what happens in in any kind of legalism. There's, okay, here's the barrier. How do I get around it? It's not just women, too. Uh, there's a very famous Orthodox Jewish uh, reggae singer named Modest Yahoo. Do you remember that name? I do remember. And he had some really big hits on the radio. He was huge for a while. And he, uh, as an Orthodox man, he would sing about the Messiah. He wanted Moshiach now, he would sing. And it was in reggae. It sounded like a, uh, you know, just a classic reggae, you know, song. And so a great singer. And everybody loved, I think part of his appeal, part of his shtick, was that he was orthodox and he had a long beard and he wore the black, you know, suit, the whole thing and the hat. And then all of a sudden, I, I think it was a stun to his fans. He goes, I'm done. And he shaved his beard and he put on normal clothes and he, you know, he moved on from that. And I, I, I think that's actually pretty common in the orthodox world where you kind of almost wake up and you have a revelation. You go, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think that's also in the Jewish in the women who want to, they still want to maintain their identity as an orthodox Jewish woman, but they don't want to follow the, the rabbi 700 page book. Well, there's another one. This gal's name is Haiki Moore of uh, Ateneel, is a self-proclaimed Pashika Hasid whose authenticity, authentic, Authenticit, authenticity. Oh. There you go. Oh, yeah, Two yeah. episodes in a row. Yeah, I can't. What are you doing? I can't read. In my <laughs> servants of God, of God is paramount. This carries over into all parts of my life. In my relationships, in my emotional and mental well-being, and in my own self-identity, it is the most important thing to me and guides my aid, my agency in my Jewish practice. So when I begin to get frustrated with my hair covering, I started digging. I looked into Hasidic uh, history and progression of hair covering and realized that it had not been appropriate for me to have put a head covering on without this element of understanding. I am now much more relaxed in my view. So in other words, she's saying, you know what's important? Which, by the way, I think she's on the road. This is important. The practice is okay, but what's important is pleasing God, not man. That's right. A great principle for Christians. Uh, because guess what? I found out when I got saved that there are some Christians who are doing things not because they want to, but because they're trying to please appear, or this is what the tradition is. They don't like it, and they're worried about other people, and et cetera. And to a certain extent, we should. We don't want to cause somebody who's a weaker brother or sister, but at the same time, we're not living for other people. We live for God. That's and right. I think these ga this gal— is figuring that out. So uh, it's just an interesting read, and the link is in our show notes. Yeah, if you want, it's a long, we can't, we can't go through the whole one, thing. But it's very interesting to show where the culture is going in the Orthodox community. Um, and culturally. speaking of where it's going, read this one, yeah. Chris. Religious, this is our next one from Jerusalem Post as well, which says this. Religious parties to demand reforms to law of return as coalition bargaining chip. Steve. Uh, I'm telling you, here we go. Their demand is to cancel the grandson clause, which states that even a person who is the grandchild of a Jew can immigrate to Israel. Chris, this is a major thing that's happening and has implications uh, above even what we can understand, and that is in the last election, just recently, uh, a, a large portion of the Knesset, a larger portion of the Knesset is now going to be very religious. It's crazy. And it's so crazy. they're going to be can part I, of the co coalition. I want to read to you really quick the parties that made it into the into the par Israel's parliament. So Likud has 31 seats. Uh, that's Benjamin Netanyahu's party that has the largest number of seats, 31. You need to get to 120 seats in order for you to be prime minister and have a coalition. You have to have more 61. than 61. 60. That's right, 61 seats, more than 60. Um, and so Likud has 31. That's a big number. The next one is the Liberal Party, which is Yeshatid. They got 24 seats. That was Lapid's uh, group. That's right. And then listen to this: religious Zionism got 14 seats. That's they doubled. That's they doubled. Huge. They had seven and they doubled. Uh, National Unity got 12. Shas is a very Orthodox Jew, uh, political party, Orthodox Jewish political party. They got 12 seats. Which they went up to. Yep. 
United Torah Judaism uh, got eight, uh, eight seats. Uh, here, Israel Betenu, which is another conservative but a secular conservative Israeli party, got five. Then an Islamic Muslim party got five. Hadash Ta'el got five. And Labor, which is like we used to be the powerhouse uh, of parties, um, going back to Israel's founding, only has four seats. That's the, I think that's the lowest they've ever had. And they used to be election after election. You, you look at the first prime ministers, they were all Labor. Yep. Everybody was Labor. But when you add up religious Zionism, 14, uh, Shas, which is 12, and United Torah Judaism, which is 8, that's a lot of religious seats. That'll put that'll put Benjamin Netanyahu over the top if uh, the president asks him to form the government. But once again, we run into a problem because the religious parties want them to reform the law of return. The law of return basically says any Jewish person, any Jewish person, um, which goes this goes back to Israel's founding, which is great. Any Jewish person can simply show up with a rabbi note um, for the most part and go, I'm Jewish. Boom, you've got Israel. You could get Israeli that's, citizenship. Well, uh, that, that, that's a whole controversy when you come to Christ and you okay. consider messianic. But no, you're right. The, 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 to make Aliyah, you simply had to be Jewish, and you're automatically a citizen of Israel. No but matter if, you where you didn't, live. if you didn't state what your faith was, you could just show up and if boom, they don't passport, ask you, yep, you're in. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. But that's the law of return. But and they they tweaked it for a while when there was a more liberal government. And what defines a Jew? It always was your mother is Jewish. Well, uh, there was a law passed a while ago. A tweak from the Knesset is they allowed for one Jewish parent. If if you have, and then if you're mar- if you're Jewish and you're married to a Gentile, they could go with you. So they tweaked it. But the the part that's interesting is n- now that these religious groups are rising to power, they're going to start to negotiate. Netanyahu won't care, by the way. I don't think personally he'll care. You're Jewish, you got well, fam, and you want to come to Israel, fine. But not if you're putting together a government. That's right. And they have a lot of power, and you got that's politics or blackmail or call it whatever you want. They have to be able to negotiate these kinds of things. And uh, the religious parties are going to want to take over those ministries in Israel that relate to the law of return. So they're already talking about this law of return issue. They haven't even had a chance to form the government yet. Uh, The president of Israel has not given Netanyahu the chance to form the government. He does have 65 seats. We know this. But here's the thing. When you have religious Zionism, Shas, and United Torah Judaism that are all saying, we want this law of return changed, then all of a sudden you get the other conservative secular group that's run by Avigdor Lieberman, which is called Yisrael uh, Betenu. He says this. I think this is so interesting, Steve. He says uh, 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 the, uh, that the finance minister Avigdor Lieberman attacked the religious Zionist party, which includes Noam and the Haradi parties, which is the Orthodox, intention to change the law of return. This is a divorce certificate to Jewish diaspora and thousands of soldiers in the IDF who came to Israel based on the grandfather clause were, quote, far more Jewish than the Orthodox students at Yeshiva. So he's slapping those religious people in the face, the secular guy is slapping them in the face and saying, all these people that you're going to turn away are serving in the Israeli army, and they are serving the country. They're more religious than you. They're more Israeli and Jewish than you'll ever be because the religious are not required to go to the army for service. Chris, if you want a commentary on Acts 15 That's just gonna and say. much dispute, this is it. it. It's a different topic, but just watch, just watch and pay attention to what's going on Every time there's an election in Israel, there is much dispute. <laughs> All the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th- this is actually very similar to how this whole five-year, four-year process of Israel's elections got started to begin with. And we don't have time to get into it, but it's very reminiscent, if you will. But but anyway, Steve, are you ready for the— I know you picked out the word again. I think it's great, and it has a ring to it that seems— Kind of familiar to me, that, Chris. Okay, you got to explain this. All right, here we go. So I found this one, this Yiddish word of the day. It's breit. Here we go. Hold on a second. Breit heartsick. Breit heartsick, which means it's not ge- break herzig. No, it's not break herzig. <laughs> it's breit heartsick, which means generous or broad-hearted. So to be generous. And the reason I chose this was because God was being very generous in his kindness and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness 
to the Ninevites. Uh, they didn't deserve that. What they did were, they were horrible. The things they did were atrocious. And yet God still forgave them, which shows God's generosity and his kindness and his mercy and his grace, which we're going to learn about next week from chapter four, uh, because uh, Jonah doesn't like that he's so kind and, gra and gracious. So anyway, I, you know, whenever I go to Israel and they ask, I get in conversation, they ask me, oh, what's your name? And I say, oh, Herzig, Steve Herzig. Oh, Hartzig, the heart, the heart. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> but you're generous. You are a generous guy. Uh, I don't know. You got a broad heart. Uh, I like it. <laughs> well, everyone, that's the Yiddish word of the day. Brett Hartzik. I'm so glad that you all could be with us. Hey, another great episode of the Jew and Gentile podcast. Steve, we were busy today. And busy, now busy. remind them, Chris, what takes place Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday night is our Zionism class. You can go learn about biblical Zionism, political Zionism, where it all came from. Uh, and Paul Pierce will be the teacher. If you want to register for that much class, dispute. much dispute, yeah, <laughs> much dispute, and much to talk about, uh, you can go to foiequip.org to register for free for that class. Hey, really quick too, we're gonna have our 2023 classes coming up soon. You're not gonna want to miss it. We're gonna launch those before the end of the year. But uh, keep a lookout. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you next week.